This is the Change in the Coalfields podcast brought to you from the Marshall University Eye Center podcast studio. And this week is really special because longtime pastor of Shepherdstown Presbyterian Church is our guest, uh, Pastor Randy Tremba. Randy was my pastor during my time in Shepherdstown, five of the best years of my life. Randy has really been a mentor for me, spiritual, personal, and professional mentor for me. I've learned so much from him over the years, and now I get a chance to, uh, to, to learn even more from him. Randy, thanks for your time today. Uh, you're welcome. Th- thanks for uh, chatting with me, and uh, I am honored that you consider me a mentor. I, I can always say if I did nothing else in life but mentor Brandon Dennison, that would have been worth it. <laughs> but uh, when I met you, you pretty much had the convictions and visions for your life, I think. The best thing I did was did no harm. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I, I wasn't not even thinking about that. But yeah, the first time we met, of course, I, I came to Shepherdstown as a freshman. I came, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, so I thought I'll check out the Presbyterian church nearby. Uh, your sermon really grabbed my attention as having some, some new ideas, some new approaches to church I hadn't heard before. So I rode my bike over to your office hours, and you were willing to talk with me for more than an hour. You never met me. In my life, we had a great conversation, and a couple of weeks later, you called and said, "You know, we don't have a youth director right now, so I wonder if you'd be willing to help out with our youth program." And we're willing to just put a lot of faith and trust in me, and that led to truly some of the best experiences of my life, Randy. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I guess that was one of the better decisions I made. I kind of pride myself in getting a good impression of people when I meet them, and I saw right away you had the qualities we were looking for to influence our youth and give it some, some direction. You struck me right away as being a person passionately interested in the environment, wilderness, I was, yep. preserving, preserving nature and deep roots within uh, our faith. So, and you were winsome, articulate. I'll stop there. <laughs> Don't let my head, will, my head won't fit in these uh, earphones anymore. <laughs> so you were the pastor um, at SPC for 42 years. That the right? That's right. I started in uh, 1975 and uh, retired in uh, five years ago, 2017. Is that common for a minister to stay in one place for so long? No, I think the average is probably five to seven years. The Shepherdstown Presbyterian Church was founded in 1743. So some of my successors were there for 20 years. And one, Dr. Gieselin, was there for 44 years. Once I got to 30, I started thinking about that record. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's a record I could break. I'll just keep going. I'll be known as the, the Iron Man of the Presbyterian Church, the Cal Ripken of the Presbyterian Church. But once I got to 42, I thought that was enough. My ministry bridged two centuries, from the 20th century to 21st century, and a millennium. Not bad. <laughs> so that's something my predecessor could never say, Dr. Gleason. So I said, let the old man have the record. <clears throat> I'm done, and I, I was ready to leave. I felt, I felt I was leaving behind a great, healthy community, and um, felt proud of having. Well, a lot of people helped build that community, and it continues to this day, not only surviving but thriving despite everything. What's uh, what's been going on in in retirement? Well, the first day of my retirement, I just sat down in a chair, and thought I'd get used to vegetating, <laughs> and that that got old. It was so relief. It was such a relief. Not to have multiple things coming to me at once. You know, you got weddings, you got funerals, you got marriage issues showing up, and then meetings after meetings after meetings, a sermon preparation. I loved it all and never thought I was under stress until I, the day I retired, I felt this weight go off my back. So vegetating wasn't the way to go into retirement. I had figured to do something. And a friend of mine, Bill Howard, remind, he said, you, you're, you're a good writer. You need to keep writing and people want to hear from you. So he helped me set up a blog site, which I started in 2019, and called it The Devil's Gift. So every every Sunday, I publish a dispatch, I call it a little essay. It's always, I just decided it would never be more than 400 words, and I've kept, kept to that. A lot of them are exactly 400 words. So I work on that every week. I work on uh, my post, and it's usually about something that uh, I find remarkable or something gets under my skin. So it's great, great variety. And that I now have about 420 subscribers. I'm one of them to, to the blog to the blog site, and uh, 
in addition to that, I'm working on a book that's been on the back of my mind probably for for 20 years. So in the mornings I do writing, either the blog or on the book. In the afternoon, I live in eight acres of woods, which I treated as wallpaper for the longest time. Once I retired, I noticed it. So, wow, we live in eight acres and it needs some stewardship, some management. So uh, every afternoon, weather permitting, I go out and do some maintenance in the woods. And my grandchildren have helped me build a nature trail about a mile long, weaving through the woods. And that takes some maintenance too. Beautiful. Two things, anybody who, who knows Randy, two defining elements of your personality, in, in my opinion, one is succinctness and timeliness. So you ran a service that ran, you, you prided yourself on going right on time. We went one or two minutes over, you were, you were disappointed. I kicked and, myself, um, yeah. Yeah, and then facetiousness. I, would, I, I think that's the right word. You're, I, I feel like you're, sometimes you like to be purposely challenging and, and thought provoking and the name of your blog alone. So a former minister has a blog called the devil's gift. Tell us a little bit about the thinking that goes into the branding there. After I retired, somebody asked me to write an essay, what I was doing in my retirement for the local good newspaper. And so I reminisced about where I, where I learned to write. I guess I was inspired in high school but I never ever thought of myself as a writer, even though I did a lot of writing. I wrote a sermon every week. And so I imagine myself in retirement being in a cave, my cave, and I imagined the devil showing up. And the, and the devil said to me, I'm so glad you're in this cave doing nothing, because when you're out there in the arena preaching peace, love, justice, and understanding, I hated it. That drove me crazy. I'm glad you're not doing that anymore. I'm glad you're not letting your little light shine anymore. And then the devil left, but he left a gift. Mm. That little light that I had, that I didn't know I had, I was gonna let it shine. So at the time I didn't associate that with a blog, but by the time I got around to making a blog, I thought, well, that, that's pretty good. The devil gave me a gift. So I called it the devil's gift and ran that title by a few people. And they thought it was kind of, they thought it was unique. Yeah, definitely. So I stuck with that. And, and the more I think about it, the devil is, it's considered in, in, in mythology as a trickster, mm. kind of challenges us. It mm. shows up in the story of the Garden of Eden and the serpent, which was represented as the devil later on, urges her to reach for knowledge and understanding. Mm. So she, she does. Uh, my take on that story, she's the hero. I mean, Eric Fromm, a Jewish psychologist, also agrees. He thinks Christianity misread that story. She's the hero because she really creates what human beings are all about, going for knowledge. Our reach will always be reaching for more knowledge. So she ends up being the Hebrew, uh, the hero in that story, in my opinion. That's part of my book I'm writing. And uh, the devil shows up when Jesus is out on his vision quest and challenges to define who he is and what he's gonna be like. So without the devil, you know, we might not figure out what we want in our life. So I know there's a, a dark satanic side to the devil, but there's also this trickster side that helps us figure out who we are by raising sometimes nagging questions. He said to Eve, did God really say that? I think God doesn't want you to have these powers. And he says to Jesus, can you turn these stones into bread? Jesus thinks through that because that would be a good thing to feed the hungry people of the world. And so Jesus has to maul that over and says, well, human beings can't live on bread alone. You didn't know that? All those things gave me a favorable impression of the devil. So I embraced <laughs> it. <laughs> the devil's that. gift. No, it's, it's, provoke, thought, it's, it's provocative for sure and, and unique. Absolutely. So, so you mentioned high school, sort of getting the bug for high school. So tell us about where you grew up and, and your childhood. Well, I was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. I had an older sister, four years older, brother, eight years older. And my father worked on the railroad, p and &E Railroad as a brakeman. And my mother was a, a housewife. She loved it, you know, keeping a house clean, preparing meals. And, um, then I went to, to grade school there, a block away, I got to walk. I was thinking back on it the other day, it was integrated, and I didn't even know it was integrated because I didn't know what segregation was. Hmm. So that was a blessing, you know, to walk to a grade school that was integrated, even though I didn't 
appreciate that fact that I had to walk two blocks to junior high uh, called Princeton Junior High, and then about six blocks to go to high school. And my parents were both hard, hard workers. My father grew up outside of Connellsville, Pennsylvania. His father was a coal miner and who, who emigrated from Prussia. Wow. Interesting. We have a paper that was preserved by the family. He came to the United States with a document signed by King Wilhelm of Prussia, releasing him as a subject. <laughs> but you'll no longer be a subject. So he came here, became a citizen, had raised a family and uh, worked in the mine. So my, my family was, I guess, you could, I don't know what a middle class is, probably on the lower side of the middle class. I, we didn't have a TV or a television. Never had a television when I was even through high school and only got a car when I was 12. My dad took the bus to work. My mom eventually went to work as a sh uh, shoe clerk at Strauss department store. She took the bus to work. And she only went to work because she wanted her, her children. I, of the three, was the one most interested in higher education. So she, she went to work to make that possible. Yeah, a working class family. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, now it's sort of the butt of a joke sometimes, Youngstown. But it, it was a really great community, very ethnically diverse, uh, four or five steel mills, lots of trains going through there. And Youngstown State University is there and Mill Creek Park. So you know, you take for granted where you grow up and you go back, you realize, wow, that, this was a great place to grow up. I'm glad I did. You grew up with a lot of baseball, right? My dad was a uh, semi-professional baseball player. You know, Eastern Pennsylvania produced a lot of great baseball players. They played all the time. So, yeah, my dad taught me to love baseball. In fact, when I was eight years old, I went to try out for the Little League. And um, we didn't have a car, so my brother... Jerry rode me on his Schwinn bicycle about five miles to the tryouts and we were late. So the, the adult running the thing said, I'm sorry, you're late. Come back next year. My brother said, I just drove, rode him five miles. You give him a tryout. My brother had a temper. He could get angry. Yeah. So the guy said, oh, oh, okay, go out there and I'll hit you a fly ball. I missed the uh, first one, caught the second one and came in. He said, well, that wasn't too bad come back next year. What's your, we'll take your name. And I said, Randy Tremba. And he said, what are you Michael Tremba's son? I said, yeah. He said, you're on the team <laughs> because again, I didn't know this. My dad was highly, highly admired by people for his baseball, his baseball skills. So yeah, my dad taught me to love baseball for sure. And all that goes with that, you know, the discipline of being an athlete and work, teamwork. So I'm really grateful for that introduction the baseball that he gave me. You mentioned your grandfather. One of my favorite of all your blogs was about uh, his story. And you sort of later in life uncovered some, um, some more background on him that you didn't know for a long time, right? It was only about a year ago. I, my cousin and I reconnected. Johnny Tremble uh, grew up in Connellsville. His, his, his father stayed in Connellsville. So my cousin, John, he's, he's my age. He went to Penn in Philadelphia. And then we reconnected and, um, you know, I started asking questions about the family. He's kind of the keeper of the family memories. And he was telling me some things. And I said, well, I'd like to come up and see where my grandfather's buried. I've never seen that. So Paula and I and our daughter, Amanda, uh, we went up about last fall. And he took us to the, uh, the, the mine area where my grandfather worked. My father never worked in the mine, but his older brothers did. My father was the youngest, one of the youngest of the eight. He had done some research on my grandfather's death. His name was Jacob, and uh, he worked in the coal mines. He uh, refused to live in company housing. The company houses were very popular. He wouldn't do that. And the miners were paid in script, which they could only use at the company store. My grandfather, Jacob, refused. He demanded to be paid in dollars. So that indicates, I never met him, obviously, but uh, indicates he had a feisty spirit. Agitator. <laughs> Agitator. And not surprisingly, he was, he was one of several that were trying to organize coal miners into a union. Wow. And he got a lot of grief from, from management for that. He had an accident, broke his hip, had to go home. And uh, he healed and he came back. And the second or third day he, he came back, he was, well, he was cheered by the men when he came back. And then the second or third day, he got deathly sick and he died. 
within a day or two, and they determined it was because he, he was poisoned by the water he drank on the floor of the mine. That's what the, that's what the owners claimed. And everybody who knows any miner right. who's worked in the mine, right. no, they don't drink water at the bottom of the mine. He took his own water in. Right. So you connect the dots because of his reputation of trying to organize a union. Uh, the conclusion is that he was murdered. He was poisoned and, and got out of the way. Yeah, it was my father, Jacob. So yeah, a lot of me, I'm very proud to be a, the grandson of a coal miner. I mean, they really fueled this country for what, 250 years? Absolutely. Those coal miners. And uh, I think I put in that blog, I, I think our nation owes a debt of gratitude to the coal miners. Obviously, we got to move away to other sources of energy, but there should be a major monument in Washington, D.C. to coal miners in gratitude for the way they fueled this country and made it what it is today because of their hard and really sacrificial work as much as any military man. I mean, they gave their lives, many of them, to make to fuel this country, to heat it, to move it, mm -hmm. to energize it. So yeah, that that's my uh, that's my grandfather. I'm quite proud to be a grandson of such a man. Extraordinary, amazing story. I you know the company town script efforts to unionize the coal industry. I'm sort of shocked a lot when I travel to different conferences and convenings of very socially active people in our country do not know that history. A lot of it, I guess, has probably been purposefully sort of whitewashed out of the textbooks, but we've got to tell those stories and, and, and understand it. Well, yeah, I think historically unions is what really created the middle class because they, well, they, they, they paid a high price for it. I mean, uh, goon squads were sent out to kill them, many of them, but they eventually won in this and, and got, you know, uh, safer working environments and better wages and benefits and, and pensions. So yeah, the, the union is a big part of our story of success in the United States. And you know, my, my takeaway is what, what that, that's how you get things done is by associating with other people, whether it's a union or a cooperation like you're doing at Coalfields, you got to get people to cooperate yep. with each other for a common goal because there's strength in multitudes. And basically that, that's what a union is, but there's other, other ways of cooperating and, and getting things done. It doesn't have to be a formal union, but definitely my understanding of how people get things done is through cooperation as much as possible. So you started on the Western edge of Appalachia, you know, the Appalachia Regional Commission technically considers Youngstown to be in the Appalachian region on the very Western edge of it. And Shepherdstown, Jefferson County is the very Eastern edge, one of the most Eastern counties in what the federal government calls Appalachia. Now there's a lot of different you know, definitions of Appalachia, but give us the, the long version of the story. How'd you, how'd you get, what was your journey from the Western edge of Appalachia as a kid playing baseball in Youngstown, grandson of a coal miner to the Eastern edge uh, to be the pastor of the oldest church in West Virginia? Is it the oldest? I think so. I haven't heard of any one that's older yet. Yeah, 1743 is pretty pretty old. I think it is maybe in West Virginia, at least a Presbyterian church. Oldest Presbyterian one. Yeah, sure. well, you know, the Scotch Irish settled this uh, this region. When I when I was about to graduate from high school, my father, who was a devout, born again fundamentalist Christian, didn't trust higher education. My mother, who only had an eighth grade education, she grew up in Georgia. She admired cultured people. So she always wanted her children to do two things. One, three things. One, learn how to play the piano because she thought all cultured people play the piano. Two, she wanted to have clean fingernails because she knew the poor people in Georgia had dirty fingernails. And my dad had clean fingernails. That's one reason she married him. <laughs> and third, get an education. She thought that was the ticket. My dad, she, my mother heard about Wheaton College in Illinois, uh, which was a Christian liberal arts college. And as soon as my dad heard the word liberal, he wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't like the word liberal anywhere. Mm. So, but my mother won that battle and I went off to Wheaton College, an evangelical liberal arts college. I got, a, I think, a good education. It, it moved me from fundamentalism into becoming an evangelical. And after four years, I graduated with a philosophy major. I had no, no idea what to do with that. 
And my advisor said, well, you can go to seminary and read theology at somewhere. So I went to Pasadena, Fuller Theological Seminary, to read theology only to find out you're supposed to be a minister when you go to seminary. So I said, really? I, I didn't read the small print. So I wasn't opposed to that. And um, I interviewed to be a, a youth director in Baptist church. I grew up Baptist and the Baptist minister wasn't impressed with me. He wouldn't hire me. So I panicked and I looked on the job board and there was a Presbyterian church open in Whittier looking for somebody. And I found them to be much more flexible, more intellectual, this worldly compared to fundamentalism, which can be otherworldly, you know what I mean? Like this, like this earth is a launching pad to get to heaven. But Presbyterianism, John Calvin, really embraced the earth, this life. And I like that. And I thought um, their approach to the Bible was more metaphorical than literal. So I got ordained in the Presbyterian Church. And, but I didn't like Southern California. I didn't. There's no weather in Southern California, just mm. climate. And I missed the seasons. And uh, <clears throat> I finished up my uh, work at the Presbyterian Church in Whittier and uh, actually got disenchanted with institutional Christianity and decided I'd try something else. I want to be near my parents in Youngstown, but not too close. So I accidentally drove through Harper's Ferry one day on my way to see them. And I said, wow, Harper's Ferry, Potomac, Shenandoah Rivers, they come together, there's little mountains. There must be hobbits in these hills. I just finished... <laughs> I just finished reading Tolkien's The Hobbits, and yeah. I said, there must be hobbits. This is, I've never seen a place like this. So I, I just rented a room, drove off the road, found a room, and decided I'd work in the uh, apple orchards and just to ch change my life around. So I worked in the apple orchards and was content to do that, although I was trying to organize the workers to get higher wages. It's in your blood. <laughs> <laughs> just couldn't, couldn't help myself. And I worked for Cesar Chavez in California. So these guys are family men. Uh, I was just a kid, but they were family men making $1.25 an hour to support a family. And I thought we could get organizing and, and get higher wages. In the meantime, I met the Presbyterian minister in Shepherdstown. We became friends. He was young, but he suddenly re resigned. And he told the uh, session on the way out the door, he said, if you need somebody to preach, there's a guy in a orchard who's a licensed Presbyterian minister call him and they did and i said no i don't want anything to do with the church right total now total john the baptist vibe going on here yeah amos <laughs> out yeah, amos. amos all right amos out pruning i was out pruning trees so so they called me and i said no nah, not really and they said well just just how about just sundays and i said well I'll, I'll i'll i can do a service i'll preach until you find a real minister and then i fell in love with the congregation and they with me and um, the rest is history they called me to be the full-time minister and uh, I got over my disenchantment with the church because it was such a small church of lovely community. And uh, I just felt at home there and decided that this is where I raised my family. You mentioned how beautiful Harper's Ferry is. I know you like to quote, there's a rock that Thomas Jefferson visited and looked out over the rivers converging in the hills and said this was worth a journey across the Atlantic. Is that right? Yeah, there's a plaque up there that actually says that. When you came to visit me at Coalfield Development, you know, we had a great trip. I took you to all these amazing projects. You know, I was so proud to show you all these different sites. We drove all over southern West Virginia. On the last day, I took you to Hillbilly Hot Dogs. And yeah. of the entire trip, I think that made the biggest impact. And you said, ah, this is worth the drive across the state to eat yeah. at Hillbilly Hot Dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote a blog about them. I don't know if you did I ever send that to you? You did, yeah, yeah. It's you called did. Hillbilly Hot Dogs, a love story. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell the story about how those, I don't know the owners, but I, I did some research and found out uh, how they fell in love and they were living out west, I think, and they came back home and went up Hillbilly Hot Dogs. That's right. People get married there. People do get married there, right? They have one of, the, one of their hot dogs called the Widowmaker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you were brave enough to try that. I don't think Paula would let you try that one. No. No way. Um, you, you sort of threw in there, and I had heard this before, you, you did some organizing work with Cesar Chavez. Um, I wasn't a key player, but in Southern California, that was the era, 1970, boycott grapes, table grapes and lettuce. And uh, 
a good friend of mine was very active with the United Farm Workers and he, he convinced me to help out. So I went out in, in some of their demonstrations and went out to the, um, the lettuce fields in one of their planned demonstrations about five in the morning. I never, and I did get to see and meet him. Actually, he stayed in the house, uh, about five families shared a house and he and his wife came and stayed in the house where we lived. But it just so happens I went to a Joan Baez concert that night, so I missed him. Oh, man. You said you fell in love with the congregation and, and they with you. And it's it's a remarkable congregation. And it's really defined, I think, by just a deep commitment. I think you said this worldly. Um, that resonated with me, a commitment to social justice, environmental justice. Racial justice. Racial justice. Gender absolutely. justice, yeah. What, what is it about that place? And maybe could you share some stories uh, about that congregation that have inspired you? Well, when I, I came there, I found out that that church was organized in 1743. That's before the United States of America. And the building, the meeting house was built in 1836. That's before the Civil War. So that's a real, for America, that's a real historical place. Right. During the Battle of Antietam, it served as a hospital and many wounded and dying, mostly Confederates probably, came and laid on the, they took the pews out, laid them on the floor and, and many young men died there, some recovered and left. And when I heard that story, I thought this is a very special, holy place mm -hmm. that the men of the children, the sons of our nation lay there dying and probably their dying breath was for peace, you know? I urged the congregation to realize they are standing on holy ground every time they come in there and that we should be uh, a house of prayer for peace and that we should be a school of love. I think Sh Shepherdstown also has NSDA inclusivity in the sense that Thomas Shepherd, the namesake of the town was an Englishman and the nearby town Charlestown was very English and stayed English. Uh, and they could, English could be very snooty at that time. But Thomas Sh Shepherd encouraged Germans to come down from Pennsylvania. And at that time that was kind of bold to integrate with English and Germans coming together to work. He wanted them to work. But I, I, I always tell people that I think that idea of inclusivity was in Shepard's founding. That's part of her D DNA. And sure enough, uh, back in the 60s, Shepherdstown became a safe haven for gay and lesbian people. Just the word got out, uh, you'll be safe here, you'll be welcomed. So they were welcoming. And this all happened before before I came. So there was quite a few gays and lesbians in Shepherdstown, some members of their church. And that became a very controversial issue in the Presbyterian, well, in all churches in America. Right. And the Presbyterian church debated it back and forth, back and forth, whether you should even ordain a gay person, uh, let alone let them marry. So that, that became the primary focus of our congregation, probably for 20 years to advocate for change in the Presbyterian Church to allow gays and lesbians to serve as uh, elders and deacons and ministers. And that took forever. And we hadn't even got to the marriage part yet. Suddenly in 2014, the circuit court in uh, Virginia, which embraces uh, part of West Virginia, declared same-sex marriage legal. And two of my members, Rob and Richard, They'd been together for 30 years, not married, but as a civil blessing. That was a thing back in the mm. 60s. You could have a civil blessing. So as soon as it was legalized, the first thing they did, they went to Martinsburg, West Virginia, to the clerk's office to apply for a marriage license. And they went in with fear and trepidation mm. of how they would be greeted by a West Virginian official. Right. And the woman was so thrilled that they were there, so honored that she got to submit, give them a marriage license. They were bowled over. This is why you can't stereotype people. You can't stereotype West Virginia at all. You know, mountaineers are free. And I think they're saying free to love who you want. So she gave them the license. They were so touched by her welcome. They invited her to the wedding, which was at the Presbyterian church. It was packed. And part of the ceremony, I, I stopped and said, we'd like the clerk from Martinsburg, West Virginia Courthouse to stand up. And Rob and Richard said why they had invited her. And she stood up and people applauded. And so Amazing. 
Yeah, so, that, you know, environmental issues, something we've dealt with, and I drew on Presbyterian theology, which John Calvin is famous for saying, the earth is the theater of God's glory, and the, the earth should be revered. So that, that sort of gives you a basis for to care for the earth, not to exploit it. Right. And part of my studies, I, I realized that the whole idea of dominion in Genesis was misconstrued by theologians and Christianity took that as a right to dominate creation, to exploit it, to treat creation as our food pantry. It turns out if you take the Bible seriously, the way John Calvin did, not necessarily literally, Calvin took, took the Bible seriously, but not literally, dominion is, an, is a trust from a king to care for part of his realm. So that's what dominion historically means. And so I, I built on that. I thought that was a profound insight. And I built on that saying, we do have dominion, but that doesn't, that's not a right. That's a responsibility to care for it and uh, not exploit it because you have, we have an obligation to treat it in such a way that will bring honor to the king who, who gave that to us. So I think you were there when we installed the first solar panels, I think, in Shepherdstown on the church. I had, I had moved on, but that's the beginning of a beautiful story. You know, it's cool that Dan Conant was on the podcast two episodes ago and talking also about how influential Shepherdstown Presbyterian Church was in his story. And you know, we just missed each other. I had left to go to graduate school in Indiana. Dan had moved back to start the solar company. But Than and Mary Ann, con uh, wonderful con congregants of SPC, made sure that we met and were so impressed by Dan through that project. And it helped to lead to what would become Solar Holler. That's right. Yeah. And Than, Than hit really pushed that and thought we could be a model yep. for uh other organizations and not only residential, but organizations, institutions, and uh, numerous people came to, to check it out, how we did that and how we financed it. And so, yeah, that, that, that was a, a great, great thing. But it was all made possible, I think, by a congregation that had come to realize uh, the earth is our responsibility to care for, not, not to exploit. And so what are the practical things you can do? And, shifting to uh, solar energy and wind energy away from petrol energy is the way to go, incrementally at least. It's amazing, isn't it? You just drive everywhere. You drive down to Huntington, you see them everywhere. You see windmills yep. uh, down there in the southern part of the state. So yeah, I think we're moving in the right direction, but change, cultural changes come very, very slowly because cultures have such momentum and weight. You just can't turn them on a dime. You just got to go inch by inch, row by row. And eventually you got a beautiful garden growing, but you got to start with the inch. <laughs> and it takes collaboration to your earlier point to change things. You got to have other collaborators, agitators, and, and you, you've preached many, a great sermon. You've facilitated a great congregation, weddings, funerals, all the rest, but you also helped, you worked with other ministers on a newspaper. You had a radio hour. I um, mean, you just became a full member of the Shepherdstown community, right? Well, I have a lot of ideas. I can't do them. So I have to get other people to do them for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought Shepherdstown should have a, uh, a newspaper because it didn't have any, but I wasn't prepared to do a newspaper. This is more like a tabloid. And we, with Ed Zonheiser, who's a co-founder of it back in 1979, we called it the Good Shepherd, Good Town, Good News paper. <laughs> and it, I was the executive editor. It wasn't a newspaper. We made sure there was a gap between news and paper. Ed called it the People Magazine in Shepherdstown. We did just did stories on people, and there were some essays and poetry in it, 24 pages, and it went for about 40 years, and then a convergence of circumstance made it difficult to continue. So it was it was discontinued. I think it had a 40-year run. Not bad um, at all. I, I resigned like two years before it ended. That, that had nothing to do with it. We had a new executive editor and a bunch of volunteers volunteers really made it work. It was free. We gave it away free. In fact, that was a slogan I came up with, free but not cheap. <laughs> and, and people love that. And they think I made it up, but I actually got it from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, pacifist, who was killed by, because he tried to help assassinate Hitler. Um, he said, God's grace is free but not cheap. And I always like that. Mm -hmm. People think I, I, I made that up. Free but not cheap. 
the, the Rumsey Radio Hour had nothing to do with the Ministerial Association. Yeah, the Ministerial Association were the publishers of the Good Shepherd's Good Town newspaper. But I just had this brainstorm back in the mid 80s that it would be fun to do an old fashioned radio show. A friend of mine, Ken Bethany, was a disc jockey and we were just chewing the fat in the backyard. And I said, why don't we do an old fashioned radio with, you know, script sound effects? And he said, oh, great idea. We put something together. And the, the first, it was called the Almost, Almost Heaven Radio Show of the Air. That was my title. And the, and the first uh, show, we had Miss West Virginia, who was Shepherd University student. Okay. And I thought, how funny is this to have beauty beauty person <laughs> on the radio? So after we interviewed her, uh, my little tagline, what, whatever you do, don't miss West Virginia, Miss West Virginia. Yeah, yeah. But, but we, had, we had music and it was, it was a joke that it was a radio show. We really didn't have a radio sh station, but we just pretended we did. But uh, so many people liked it and heard about it and missed it. Uh, we decided to repeat it. And we got Reynolds Hall and Shepherd University because I did not want it to be associated with the church. I didn't need another church thing. I thought this would be like a little hobby, sure. something I could do uh, away from the church. So we started producing about uh, once a month, a, a 90 hour, 90 minute show. And eventually got to about 16 or 17 radio stations. Uh, we do live, what's called live to tape, just what Steve Colbert does, by the way, live to tape. Mm -hmm. So you tape it like, like it's live and then you send the tape to the stations. And I, that was a lot of fun. It was kind of a I think it was 60 minutes long. It was a knockoff on Prairie Home Companion. I always say it was a better show because Prairie Home Companion requires a commitment. It's two hours long. This is only an hour. I said, That's where I got my fixation on the importance of time. I said at the beginning, anybody who knows Randy, he's succinct and on time. Time, yeah. When you're on the radio show, you got everything's got to be precise. And that's where I also learned to involve children start involving children. And, and uh, a lot of the stuff I started doing on the radio show, I said, I should bring some of these things into the church service. You know, church service uh, doesn't have to be boring. It should be, in, doesn't have to be entertaining. It should be entertaining on one level or engaging and it should incorporate children. So I started working children into leadership roles. Another thing I came to learn is that most human beings don't want to be consumers. They want to be producers. And that, that's a hard thing to learn when you're a leader that people want to be part of the production, not just consume what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of a shift in paradigm for me, kids could tell where the action was. It was up front. Yeah. So I developed this rotation so that every age group got a leadership role every single Sunday. I was very pleased how that turned out. Kids have grown up now. I remember that. They used to name three nations and bless them at the globe. I think you remember that. I do. And one of the school teachers said, I don't know what, 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 what they're doing at the Presbyterian Church, but all these kids pass geography tests better than anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah, it's great. You do three countries and then you do it. They bless a plant and an animal. You could pick an animal. Yeah, we got the list from the United Nations. So we did like all the nations eventually. They, and I'd give them in advance the nations and went systematically by continents. After I became more environmentally conscious, I thought the kids should also think about the, the, the natural world, an animal or a plant that they want to bless. So they worked on that at home and they came and they announced and some, some of them were kind of funny what they would come up with. So we blessed the nations and, and we would end by saying, God bless all these nations and all pe all creatures great and small. We're, we're coming up on time. And I'd like to just ask you uh, my, my question that I ask all my guests, which is what are some of the biggest changes you've seen happen in, in Appalachia? during your time? And what are some of the biggest changes you've not seen yet, but you still hope to see soon? I've been here since 1975 in the Eastern Panhandle. I, I've seen healthcare grow immensely. Government installations grow immensely. Uh, Senator Robert Byrd, may he rest in peace, somehow managed to get the Coast Guard headquarters in Carnegieville, West Virginia. <laughs> Who would have thought that? <laughs> So I've seen a that lot talents. of growth. Yes, somebody said when Bird heard that there was going to be a space station, he wanted it in West Virginia. <laughs> Bird brought brought a lot of changes to Shepherdstown. The National Park Service is here. Harpers Ferry now has uh, some homeland security facility. It was it was named differently. Uh, got the name changed. So I've seen that here. I've seen the growth of tourism and a conscious effort to develop the economy of 
West Virginia around tourism. And I think the Eastern Panel bought into that very quickly. Uh, but when I came down to see you, they were talking about having those ATV yep. sports parks down there. We just, we just went to Wheeling and they're trying to rebuild some of the parts of Wheeling. And uh, so I think this effort to um, publicize West Virginia as America's best kept secret uh, is the way to go. So I, I've seen tourism increasing and more and more towns are having uh, festivals. Shepherdstown certainly has a street festival and I've heard other towns in West Virginia having those multiple ways. My granddaughters from New Mexico, they loved going down to Weston to the insane asylum. <laughs> they want to go back yeah, yeah, and right. spend the night and Moundsville has a penitentiary. There's, it's beautiful the way, the way they've been built. So there's, there's all of that in the river stuff promote. So that's what I hope is happening. Tourism is being promoted. You know, I've seen a lot of change by just coming down to see you. I don't get out of the Eastern Pan over but coming down to see you and see the changes there, how former how sons and daughters of coal miners have now accepted a new paradigm for the economy. And that is uh, solar energy, rehabilitating old buildings, which are doing great. Bringing back mountaintop removal, barren spots are now flourishing in the desert of roses blooming this is all kind of biblical stuff mm -hmm. to br bringing it's it's really the creation mandate is to to bring life out of death light out of darkness order out of chaos and that's to me that's the human vocation is wherever you are in whatever world you are try to make it more beautiful more whole more loving kind and uh, i see that going down there on coal field working from the ground up is the way to go i know eleanor roosevelt built arthurville didn't she she did from yep. the top down, I think you need both and, you know. Agreed. What, whatever it takes, addition, not subtraction. Agreed. So keep doing that. So, so I think the increase in tourism, the uh, shift to solar panels, you see them everywhere up here. And when I drive to Morgantown or down to see you, I see more of those in windmills. So, so that's encouraging. I, I think we're. I think the well, I, I'd like to see less people leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't seen them leaving up here. You know, they're pouring into the Eastern Panhandle. It, it's a That's high true. growth. A bit of a different perspective on population. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just developments, developments everywhere. Yeah. My, my hope is that we will really maximize on the tourist potential and also maximize the efforts you're doing down there and other people for alternative forms of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to like you've done, to, to uh, be understanding of the plight of coal miners and, the, and their children and, and to appreciate what the coal miners have done for this country and don't disparage them whatsoever and be sympathetic with their anxieties about where the jobs are coming from. Education, that's always a good thing, education. And give people reasons to live. I, I, I think I referenced Jesus said, you can't live by bread alone which I take to mean you can't live on money alone. You, of course, you can't live for very long without either <laughs> money. <laughs> money Realistically, yeah. yeah. But the whole point is, and so, some of my liberal friends always complain about West Virginians and other relatively poor people who vote against their economic interests all the time. They say, I can't believe these people are so stupid. They're, they're, they're voting for candidates that aren't gonna help them out economically and financially. They're gonna lose money, not make money. And I had to remind my liberal friends, I said, you know, there's actually people who value things higher than money. Mm -hmm. Money isn't everything. Maybe it is to you, but there are a lot of people that would be happy to make less money if they could feel pride about who they are and what they're doing. So I think this is a, uh, a false god in the, in the liberal aspects of our politics is that money is going to solve everything. That underestimates what human beings are about. People want to feel proud of their, of their work, proud of their country. And if there's a candidate that will help them feel proud, they're going to support that. I won't get into details, but I think you've seen uh, how important that is to people. Uh, we just value things differently. And so I respect that about Appalachian people. As much as money is important to them, I think they have come to show the rest of us that there's other things more important than money. You can have very little money, but you can have a good family. You can be proud of what you're doing and what you've accomplished. Great perspective. Yeah. I wish I had a pulpit. I, I, might, I might start preaching here. 
Yeah, man. <laughs> 42 years, you know, you get good thing. Certain, I don't certain habits develop. Randy, you, you truly, you've been a, a blessing to me and a mentor. And I've, I've, I learn from you every time we engage and I get encouragement from you. And, and, and now later in life, uh, you're just a good friend. And, uh, and, and you're also happen to be a, a fine storyteller. So this has been a treat for me and it will be for our listeners and appreciate your time today. Also, well, thank, thanks again for including me. I'll be down to see you one of these days. Come on down, op open invitation. So be ready. All right, Randy, thanks so much. Ah, God bless.